Adams State College. Great stories begin here. So welcome everyone to this evening's Adams State College faculty lecture. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Roberts of the Government Department. Uh, Dr. Roberts got his PhD at the University of Missouri, St. Louis, in political science. He's here at Adams State College in his third year, finishing up his third year as an associate professor of government here. And we all need to give him a little applause because he earned tenure this year. So yeah. congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> now you get to clap again and welcome our speaker, Dr. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I should first introduce uh, my student assistant, Jessica Lardy. He's my American Express card. I never leave home without him. <laughs> I've, uh, I'm totally incapable of doing more than one thing at a time, so I can't pass out papers in class and talk, I can't move a mouse and talk, I can't do more than one thing at a time. Uh, so he's going to help with all of that. I'd like each of you to think about something. I was going to have you fill out a, a little survey type thing, but we wouldn't have time to uh, keep track. But imagine that there are two candidates running in an election. These two candidates hold polar opposite views on issues. Candidate X, we'll call him or her X, shares your views on all of the issues that are important to you. So whatever it is you care about, abortion, taxes, war, health care, that'll vary from person to person. But whatever it is you care about, candidate X has your views. Candidate Y disagrees with you on everything. It seems easy. Vote for candidate X. That's a no-brainer. But here's the rub. While candidate Y differs on the issues, she is virtuous, honest, a loyal family person of the highest quality. X, on the other hand, is a scoundrel who has cheated on his wife more often and with more women than even Tiger Woods. <laughs> he has also embellished his military record. He owes back taxes and is known to have fathered several children out of wedlock. Who do you vote for now? What matters most, policy? or probity. My research concerns the effects of scandals on congressional careers and elections. Do they matter? How? Why? And under what circumstances? However, beneath the surface, there lies an important normative issue. Before I took my third research methods course in graduate school, I was a qualitative uh, person. I wanted to teach political philosophy. And then a little light bulb went off in my head with numbers and statistics. I was like, oh, I get it now. Statistical research. But I still always have in my mind philosophical questions. The normative issue, namely, is what should matter in making the vote choice. It's frequently stated these, these days that uh, I don't vote for the party, I vote for the person. If I had a dime for every time I've heard that, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd be retired living in Wisconsin, my favorite spot on the earth. It's in vogue to stress individual qualities such as character, honesty, virtue, over mere partisanship and ideology. All things being equal, choose the candidate who is the better role model, a better human being, has high moral character. But things are not usually equal in politics. They're not equal in the voting booth. 
Candidates differ on issues such as health care, abortion, taxes, war, spending, education, and so on. So what matters most? Issues on policy or personal traits of the candidates? These are questions I don't propose to answer. Instead, each citizen must tangle with this on their own. But I've done considerable research on the empirical issues. Do scandals matter? And I hope to discuss just a small sliver of my research this evening. I'm a quantitative researcher. I use numbers, math, statistics, I'll try to keep my talk at least somewhat interesting. The, um, I'm not much of a typist. I've never really mastered that. So one of the uh, secretaries when I was in graduate school typed parts of my dissertation. And she said once that uh, Roberts is a deceiver. He's got this really sexy title for his dissertation, Sex, Money, and Deceit scandals in congressional elections, but having typed it, I can tell you it's as boring as hell. <laughs> it's just full of numbers, you know? People want these titillating stories about individual scandals, and here there's all these, like one half of my dissertation was just tables and graphs and charts and regression analysis and things. But I'll try to keep it interesting. And I'll begin with a few minutes of discussion about some titillating scandals, just so that you're not all disappointed. Uh, you will hear a little smut tonight. But the thrust of my talk will deal with uh, my quantitative research. Um, if anything appears confusing or you're not clear, uh, ask. Sometimes, uh, even though I'm dealing with basically just tables tonight. Uh, still, when you put it all on the screen, it seems to be a little, can appear to be a little confusing. Um, so let me know. Scandals are nothing new to American politics. Uh, today, uh, political scandals are about as frequent as athlete, athletic or Hollywood scandals. But unlike the NFL or the NBA, political scandals date all the way back to colonial days when well, we didn't have an NFL or an NBA. In 1702, the first cousin of Queen Anne arrived in Manhattan. He was the British Governor General of the New York Colony. When he opened the New York Assembly, he did so dressed in a woman's hooped gown, <laughs> elaborate headdress, and he was fanning himself. Lord Cornbury was a drunk, a transvestite, and made profits off of political corruption. Our first president, George Washington, contrary to what you've been taught in school, had an affair with his friend and neighbor's wife, Sally Fairfax. Even in his day, Thomas Jefferson's affair with Sally Hemings and their children was rumored in the stuff of gossip. Benjamin Franklin was a statesman, an inventor, but his appetite for women surpassed Bill Clinton's. <laughs> Representative, see, I'm telling you some spicy stuff. <laughs> Representative Peyton Brooks from South Carolina attacked Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the United States Senate, beating him bloody with his cane in the dispute over slavery. James Buchanan, who was president between 1857 and 1861, was most likely our first gay president. He was, quote, roommates for 23 years with his companion, Senator Rufus King. And their correspondence with each other suggests that they shared more than just the rent. James Garfield, a president in the 18th century, was the first married president to have an affair. The election of 1884 was one of the nastiest in history. You think campaigns today are nasty? You ain't seen nothing yet. Study campaigns in the 19th century. Garfield was alleged to have had an illegitimate child 
with his mistress, Maria Halpin. And the Republican candidate, James Blaine, was accused of accepting bribes and kickbacks while a member of Congress. In addition, Blaine's wife was known to have given birth a mere three months after their wedding. Do the math. After his wife's death, Garfield, at the age of 49, married Frances Folsom, age 21. President Warren Harding cheated on his wife frequently. He had a 15-year affair between 1905 and 1920 with his best friend, James Phillips' wife, Carrie. Leading up to the election of 1920, Harding and his campaign gave the Phillipses $20,000 to pay for a trip around the world to keep them out of the country. He also gave them $2,000 a month for life if they would keep quiet. <clears throat> but Harding's crowning affair was with Nan Britton, 30 years his junior. Nan gave birth to their child in 1919, and Warren gave her hush money until his death in 1923. But that affair, while it lasted, continued even while Harding was in the White House. They frequently had affections in a closet in the Oval Office while the Secret Service stood guard to keep Mrs. Harding out of the room. <coughs> Harding was in his mid-fifties and Nan was a mere 25-year-old woman. You see, for all the heat he took, Bill Clinton was not the first president to cheat on his wife in the Oval Office with a woman half his age. While the entire Clinton affair was going on and all of my Republican friends were going on about how he's cheapening the White House and cheapening the president, I was just, you don't have a clue. We, you know, it was, it was like deja vu all over again. Of course, Frank, Franklin Roosevelt had numerous affairs and Eleanor was rumored to be a lesbian. President Eisenhower had an affair with his driver, K. Summersby, while serving as Supreme Allied Commander in Europe during World War II. John Kennedy had affairs with strippers, prostitutes, and Hollywood starlets, including Jane Mansfield, Angie Dickinson, and Marilyn Monroe. Lyndon Johnson had a voracious sexual appetite that his wife, Lady Bird, could not satisfy. Of course, Nixon had Watergate and Bill Clinton. Well, we know about Bill. Of more recent vintage, I mean very recently, we have the Republican National Committee paying $2,000 for the cost of one of the employees running up a bill at a lesbian S&M bondage theme club in West Los Angeles. Former Senator Larry Craig, our neighbor uh, to the north, was arrested for disorderly conduct in a Minneapolis airport in a restroom known to be used for homosexual casual sex. Craig asserts that he was not tapping his foot and moving his foot from his stall into his neighbor's stall, a widely used practice by gay men looking for sex in public restrooms. Current Louisiana Senator uh, James Vitter was found to be listed in the t t notorious D.C. Madam's list of VIP clients. He's not just a client, he's a VIP client. Nevada Senator John Ensign is under investigation by the Ethics Committee. He had an affair with a male staffer's wife and when discovered uh, he then used his office to steer clients to this former staffer's lobbying firm, which is in direct violation of Senate ethics rules. Our current Vice President Joe Biden saw his presidential campaign implode in 1990 when he was discovered to have plagiarized part of his speeches. And John McCain, the maverick candidate, who's opposed to pork barrel spending and the role of money in politics, he was actually rebuked 
by the Senate Ethics Committee in 1990 for his involvement with what was called the Savings and Loan Scandal. I've only begun listing the scandals. If you'd like to read uh, about some of the most egregious and titillating uh, scandals, I can share a few titles. If anyone's interested, you can jot down the titles and uh, get them, whatever, I didn't number the next slide, whatever that is. Uh, these are not scholarly academic books. These, this is popular press, okay? Uh, Nigel Hawthorne's Sex Lives of the Presidents, Wesley Haygood's Presidential Sex, Suzanne Garment's book Scandal, Shelley Ross, where you can read more about Lord Cornberry and his hooped skirt, uh, Fall from Grace, that's Grace, not Grage, uh, Sex, Scandal, and Corruption in American Politics from 1702 to the Present, uh, Jeffrey Schultz, this is actually a very good book, uh, put out by Congressional Quarterly Press, Presidential Scandals, uh, Martin Tolchin, Glass Houses, Congressional Ethics and the Politics of Venom, and Ronald Kessler, Inside Congress, The Shocking Scandals, Corruption and Abuse of Power Behind the Scenes on Capitol Hill. So you can read all sorts of uh, titillating stories about our elected officials. Uh, go to the next slide, I guess that would be two. I want to set up my research a little bit. Um, I'm not just interested in do scandals affect congressional elections, but how, in what ways. Now one thing that, that many people in the public seem to think today is that we have more scandals than we've ever had before. And there's strong reason to believe that that's actually not true. We probably have fewer scandals than in the past and less corruption than in the past. I mean, it used to be that on the, the floor of the House or the Senate, lobbyists would actually have money in envelopes and they would hand it to members of Congress who voted for Bill. I mean, they did it openly and brazenly. It was expected. What is different about today is the media. If we have any uh, journalism majors in here, you may not like what I'm about to say about your profession or your chosen career, but uh, Larry Sabato, who teaches at the University of Virginia, wrote a very good book, uh, Feeding Frenzy, Attack Journalism and American Politics. And he makes the argument that journalism, it's not so much that politicians have changed over the years, journalism has changed over the years. Back in, for some people, the good old days, the press used to be um, knowledgeable. It wasn't that they were inattentive, but they didn't really hold elected officials' feet to the fire. He called it a period of lapdog journalism, like that mutt that just like him up on your lap and you petty him and all of that. The media knew about Franklin Roosevelt and his affairs. They knew about John Kennedy. You can't live in Washington, D.C. and run in circles and not be aware of the fact that politicians were with people that they shouldn't be with, at times that they shouldn't be with them, but they didn't report it because they were friendly with the members of, of Congress and the White House. That all changed in the early 1970s with Watergate when Nixon and Watergate were exposed and we had the first president in history to resign. And the new model for journalism schools was to be critical, to go out and find corruption. If you want to win a Pulitzer Prize, if you want to get a promotion with the newspaper, go out and expose some corruption somewhere. So we entered the stage of what he calls watchdog journalism trying to expose corruption. But still there was a line between the personal, the private, and the public. They still do that line. Sabato says that today we're in a period of junkyard dog journalism. Anything goes. You've got reporters going through politicians' garbage to see if they can find any dirt on them. They hide out in trees with binoculars trying to look inside people's bedrooms. 
I mean, they do this like they do with Hollywood stars. I mean, we, at the checkout stand at City Market, or say, not to give a plug to any particular store, I guess I shouldn't do that, but we should have another rack. You know, you got National Enquirer, and you got all those smut Hollywood things. We should have one on uh, the National Political Enquirer that just puts out the smut on people. So clearly, journalism has changed. Uh, next one. Another important book that came out is by uh, Benjamin Ginsburg and Marty Schefter, Politics by Other Means, Politicians, Prosecutors, and the Press from Watergate to Whitewater. They argue that elections in the United States used to matter. Elections provided closure to the campaign. You have a campaign, you have debates, then we have an election, we count the votes, somebody wins, somebody loses, and the winner gets to serve for the next two years or four years or six years, depending on the office. But he said the parties came to realize that uh, there are other ways that you can win seats in Congress. There are other ways that you can affect the outcomes of elections. Elections don't have to finalize the campaign. If you lose the election, then you simply try to drive the winner out of office so that you can take office or drive the next one out of office. They call this uh, RIP, Revelation, Investigation, and Prosecution. That now the parties uh, try to eliminate their opponents through Revelation, Investigation, Prosecution. I mean, we see this. Republicans, and I'm sorry if you're Republican in the audience, um, But I don't make up facts. Facts are facts. <laughs> Republicans hated that Bill Clinton won the first time. He was a scoundrel, a womanizer. Um, they just couldn't stand it that the American people voted for Clinton. And so he was hardly inaugurated until right away Republicans, we need to have a special investigation. We've got... Uh, Whitewater came a little bit later. We've got Travelgate. They fired the, the, the travel person who makes all the travel plan. We, they shouldn't fire that person. There's this gate. There's that gate. There's Monica Gate. There's this, there all kinds of gates trying to drive Clinton out of office. Of course, Clinton won again in 96. That really angered Republicans. Like, damn, darn, we're stupid enough to elect this guy one time. I'm trying to be good. <laughs> But now the American people elected him a second time. So they wanted to impeach him. Impeach him for lying about sex. <laughs> Nobody lost their lives. This, the previous president, over 5,000 Americans lost their lives in Iraq. He lied about why we went to Iraq. He didn't get impeached, but if you lie about, the moral of the story is for my student in class, if you're gonna lie, don't lie about sex. <laughs> You can lie about everything else, but don't lie about sex, because that's going to get you fired or whatever. So there's a lot of evidence uh, to support the Ginsburg uh, thesis and the Sabato uh, thesis. Uh, all right, next one, Jacobson. Gary C. Jacobson teaches at the University of California, San Diego, and I placed my research on scandals in the context of his theory. He developed a theory called the, politic, uh, the strategic politician theory. Most of us, when we think about scandals, if you think about scandals at all, think that the scandal over here has a direct and immediate impact on voters. Voters go into the voting booth and say, so-and-so did such-and-such, such, took bribes, corruption, sex, whatever, and that makes me angry because I want my, I want my representative to have high moral virtue, and so we vote against them. That's the model that we usually uh, think about. What intrigued Jacobson was that they looked at all sorts of data from the 1974, and for a few of you in this room, you can go back to 74 and remember this, uh, Watergate 
happened in like 73, okay? The actual break-in was before that, but uh, Nixon resigned. And the Republicans got clobbered in the 1974 midterm elections. They had historic losses in congressional races. But they also lost in states. They lost state legislatures. They lost governor's positions. They got clobbered everywhere. And yet all of the survey research where they go out and they ask people, did you vote in the last election and who did you vote for and why, Watergate didn't come up. It didn't appear on the radar screen. So it looks like Watergate cost the Republicans the election, but people weren't saying that they voted against Republicans because of Watergate. Well, how can that be? That, that was what intrigued uh, Jacobson to do the research and ultimately write the book and develop the theory. Jacobson argues that congressional elections, which is what I look at, are dependent upon the environment, the conditions. There are some years that are good for Democrats and some years that are bad, are bad for Democrats, good for Republicans. The economy is a major factor in the environment. Um, if it is a, and let's take this year for example. I'm sorry to disappoint my Democratic friends, but this is gonna be a really bad year for Democrats in Congress. They're gonna lose seats. Anybody, my optimist, liberal Democrats out there that don't believe me, come see me after we're done and we'll place some bets because I'm a gambling man, and I'll put whatever you want on this one, okay? Only three times since 1930 has the president's party actually won seats in a midterm election. A midterm election is the election when the president's not running, okay? President every four years, the House every two years. So this is a midterm election. Only three times has the president's party not lost seats. It's almost as predictable as the sun rising out of the east. I mean, hopefully you wouldn't bet against that one. But if you want to, see me after the talk and we'll, we'll make an arrangement. So the Democrat, this looks like a bad year for Democrats and a good year for Republicans. Well, what does that mean? That means the Republican Party is going to have much more success at going out and recruiting quality challengers to run against Democratic incumbents. And the Republican Party is going to have a much easier time finding good candidates to run for open seat races where there is no incumbents. Democrats, on the other hand, imagine that you're a state legislature, a state legislator in Colorado. And you'd like to work your way up the opportunity ladder and go to Congress in Washington, D.C. That's generally a more prestigious position than being a state legislator. If you're a Democrat, are you going to give up your current position to run for Congress in 2010? The odds aren't so good. You kind of want to keep your... You know, for those of you who work, usually it's a good idea to keep your current job unless you've got a really good probability that you're going to get another job, right? If you think you're going to get another job, then you might quit and then compete, apply, or whatever. Um, money will pour in to Republican coffers, whether it's the National Republican Party, the Tea Party has a hard time with the Republicans right now, but that'll fade but you'll give directly to the candidates rather than the party. Republicans will raise more, probably be more successful at raising money this fall than will Democrats. Because people don't like to flush money down the toilet. If you are a Democratic contributor, you're probably thinking, this is going to be a bad year for my party. I'm not going to give money because they're going to get beat. Whereas Republicans are more likely to contribute money. So all of these factors create an environment that would be good for one party and bad for the other, and that affects the behavior of what we call political elites, potential candidates or political elites, contributors to campaigns or political elites. They are responding to the conditions out there. 
There are a host of factors that go into all of this maneuvering. I put scandal in Jacobson's theory. Scandals can affect an election, and this is how Watergate affected the 1974 midterm elections. Watergate affected it in that Democrats <clears throat> had an easier time finding what we call quality candidates to run against Republicans in 1974. Republicans had a difficult time finding people who wanted to run for Congress. They kept the job they've currently got. The Democrats did much better at raising money than the Republicans. It wasn't necessarily the Republican scandal that had an immediate effect on the voters up here. It was an indirect sort of an effect. You, there's a law of politics. You can't beat somebody with nobody. Every year in House races, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of all House races are uncontested. About one out of every five House races, there is only one candidate on the ballot. Joe Stalin would have loved that, the former Soviet Union, right? So even if somebody is a scoundrel, if no one's running against him or her, the opposition's not going to win because there is no opposition, right? So the Democrats did a better job of running, finding candidates, running candidates. They raised more money than the Republicans in 1974. So even though fewer voters actually said, well, I voted for the Democrats because of Republicans and Watergate, Watergate had an effect. It just wasn't a direct effect. It was an indirect effect. I do the same thing with scandal on the individual level. If an incumbent, the person currently holding the seat, um, like a David Vitter from Louisiana today, uh, he has a scandal, the Democrats will be more likely to find a good quality, well-financed candidate to run against David Vitter. There, that means the voters are more likely to vote for the Democrat. Not necessarily because of the scandal, but because now they have a choice. They've got someone else they can choose from. The opposition may never even bring the scandal up. The scandal itself may not be a campaign issue. No one's talking about the scandal. But the mere fact that you have a quality, experienced, well-funded, attractive candidate giving speeches, you're going to increase the likelihood that people will vote for that person. Does this make sense? If not, ask me now, because it all, everything after this depends. Okay, next one. This is simply my descriptive data to show you what I'm looking at. There were a total of 630 uh, cases I looked at. I'm only talking about the Senate tonight. Maybe in a year or two I'll come back and talk about the House. I studied all Senate candidate incumbents between 1974 and 2008. So that's taking in a long period of time. 630 cases. Uh, 319 were Democrats, 308 were Republicans, and before somebody says what happened to the other three, uh, they're independents. Um, of those that sought re-election, <clears throat> this line right here, if I'm reading that right, yeah, 77% were re-elected. So being in the Senate, it's three quarters as good as having tenure. It's pretty much once you're elected, you're going to stay in office for a long period of time. 18% uh, retired. That's this line. The mean vote, if you add up all of the Senate incumbents for all of these years, their average vote is 61.7%, 62%. That's, so that's our baseline, 62%. There were 65 scandals, 11 of them had to do with sex, marriage, four of them alcohol or drugs, 
24 were financial and 26 assorted others. And there were 39 Republicans with scandals and 26 Democrats with scandals. So that's basically the database that I have. Uh, next one, Jess. This looks real confusing. Let me go across the top. This column is data for all Senate incumbents who did not have a scandal. No scandal. This column are those incumbents who had some sort of a scandal. Now I broke scandals down into two subtypes. I call them allegations and ethics cases. An allegation is simply an issue brought up by the media or the opposition. Uh, so and so's cheating on his wife. Or so and so took uh, congressional junkets at taxpayers' expense to some of the real trouble spots in the world, like Hawaii, the Caribbean, Greece. Well, I guess that is a trouble spot today, but you get the idea. But there's no legal infraction, and it's not violating Senate ethics rules, so there's no ethics investigation. That's what I mean by allegations. An ethics case is something where the actual Senate Ethics Committee is investigating that person. And the Ethics Committee can do a number of things. They can rebuke you, admonish you, uh, demand that you get back money, right up to recommend to the entire Senate that you be kicked out, you be expelled. Uh, you can be expelled from the House or the Senate. Okay? So ethics cases are, are more serious. <clears throat> so let's run through some of these. Of those who ran for re-election, 88% who did not have a scandal were re-elected. 57% of those with a scandal were re-elected. 56% if it was an allegation, 52% if it was an ethics case. So right away, just a simple table tells us there's a 31% difference there. So scandals matter, right? Uh, clearly scandals matter. Um, retired. This is the first thing I'll point out that is kind of interesting, maybe. Of those with no scandal, 18% retired or resigned. They decided not to run for re-election. Of those with a scandal, it was 23%. Allegations, it was 7 But look at this one. If it's an ethics case, 48% retired. Almost half of those said, I can read the handwriting on the wall. If I run, I'm probably going to lose. I don't want to put my family through it. I don't put myself through it. The rigors of a campaign, I'm just going to retire. So there's a, an impact. So it has nothing to do with the voters. This isn't the voters throwing them out of office. This is them, a political elite, behaving strategically. That's why Jake Hislin calls it the strategic politicians theory. Candidates, potential candidates, but there may be bumper stickers, and here I'm going to break my policy, but it's a cute bumper sticker, shit happens. Very, very little shit happens in politics. Most things are coordinated, planned, well thought out, they're acting strategically. What's in the best interest of me and are my party, okay? Politicians don't like uncertainty. They like a certain environment, a predictable environment. Uh, I think that's, look at the mean incumbent vote. Again, 62.7% of all those with no scandal, 62.7. Look at scandals, 53%. On average, if you have a scandal, you're going to lose 9% of the vote. Okay? On average. Next one, Jess. Say I told too many titillating stories. Now I don't have time for the data. What else matters in congressional elections? Because there's a whole myriad of things that matter. Well, how did you do in your last election? Clearly matters. In political science, we have this concept of what's called the marginal seat. The marginal seat is a seat that you won in your last election 
with less than 60% of the vote. So you won with 51% of the vote, 55% of the vote, 59%. If it's under 60, that's a marginal seat, meaning a competitive seat. The opposite would be a safe seat. You've won with more than 60%. Very rarely do candidates, incumbents lose when in their last election they won with 60% or more of the vote. Because, I mean, a lot of voters would have to change their minds. And Democrats tend to vote Democratic, Republicans tend to vote. There just aren't that many possible switchers to affect elections. Of those with no scandal, running in a marginal seat, 83% who ran were re-elected. Of those with a safe seat, 96% were re-elected. Now let's look at those with a scandal. Of those with a scandal, running from a marginal seat, only 52% are re-elected. But even those in a safe seat, it's a safe seat, but they have a scandal, 63% were re-elected. So the scandal clearly has an effect, and the marginality of the seat has an effect. Next one. The quality of challenger, in political science we categorize candidates in a dichotomous scale. A quality challenger, or what we call an amateur. A quality challenger is a challenger who's won some political office before. It may have been city council, it may have been school board, governor, whatever. But you've, you've ran for and won some office. You're used to shaking hands, kissing babies, eating chicken. <laughs> You're a quality challenger. An amateur <laughs> would be someone who has never won anything. Now we also put celebrities in the category of a quality challenger. So if someone's a famous basketball player like Phil Bradley was, uh, or John Glenn, the astronaut, uh, if you've got name recognition, everybody knows you, then that would also be a quality challenger because money's important in politics, not because it buys votes, because it gets your name out there. It publicizes you. Well, celebrities already have name recognition. So let's just look at that variable. Of those with no scandal, 60% are challenged by a quality challenger. 72% of those with a scandal are challenged. Money. This bottom row. I computed ratio of spending. The ratio spent by the incumbent to the challenger. Okay? How much does the incumbent spend? How much does the challenger spend? The higher the ratio, the better for the incumbent. The incumbent spent a lot of money and the challenger's broke. That's good if you're an incumbent. The lower the ratio, that's a bad thing. Of those with no scandal, the ratio is 26 to 1. For every $1 your opponent spends, you spend 26. So if your opponent spends a million, which sounds like a good deal, you spend 26 million. That 26 million is going to probably win you the election, okay? For scandals, the average ratio is 4.3. Considerably lower. So we know the candidates with scandals, incumbents with scandals, are more likely to face quality challengers and well-funded quality challengers. Go to the last one, Jess. No, not that last one, the, the next one. That's my last one. That's my last one, yeah. No, it's not, Jess. Five. There we go. No scandal, scandal. Ratio less than two to one. Ratio greater than or equal to two to one. So we're going to look at four groups here. Incumbents who don't have a scandal, where the challenger is the incumbent has a ratio less than two to one. 
and those with a no scandal were the ratios greater than two to one, and same thing for those with a scandal. What do we see? I should give you a quiz. See anything there, Deanne? Scandal's bad. Scandal's bad. We know that. <laughs> what scan? What uh, is scandal bad when we control for money? No. No. Of those with no scandal, where the ratio is less than two to one. The incumbent wins 71% of the time. If the ratio is greater than or equal to 2 to 1, they win 99% of the time. That's, that's pretty good. So that means the incumbent spending more than twice as much? Yes. If there's a scandal and the incumbent is seriously challenged um, by someone, and so the ratio is less than 2 to 1, right? The funding is kind of close. It's competitive. The challenger is almost spending as much money, or in some cases, more money than the incumbent. The incumbent only wins 39% of the time. Compare this one with this one, okay? In both cases, the ratio is less than 2 to 1. 71% without a scandal, 39% with. What happens when the incumbent is outspending the challenger by 2 to 1 or more? Well, it goes up to 85%. Right? But this 85% is still lower than that 99%. So spending clearly matters. So the thrust, I'm out of time, we need to open it up for questions. But the thrust of this is that scandals matter. As I told Robert the other day, people always want to know because they don't actually have to come to these sorts of things. So they just want to know, well, do scandals matter? And my answer is, it depends. <laughs> depends on a variety of national factors, local factors, the state of the economy, is there a scandal? Uh, I could have put up there other uh, data that I've got, but I tried to keep this uh, more simple. But scandals operate in ways that we don't normally think that they operate. It's not always directly on the voter. It has more of an indirect route, but it does still affect, I'm not saying it doesn't affect some voters directly. It does, but not all. You can't account for all incumbents who lose because of a scandal. You can't account for it simply based on thinking, well, the voters reacted negatively to so-and-so, and that's what the media loves to tell you. Hundreds of thousands of people go to the polls and vote, for hundreds of thousands of different reasons, but the media wants to narrow it down to one thing. They do it with all elections. What did the 2008 election? The voters want change. Well, some people voted for Obama because they couldn't stand Bush. Some people voted for Obama because they like Obama. A lot of blacks voted for Obama because Obama's black. A lot of whites voted against Obama because Obama's black. Some people voted for Obama because they're from Illinois and they wanted one of their own to be a president. There's all sorts of reasons why people vote the way they do. But the media wants to narrow it down to the meaning of the election. Some mystical, magical, pseudo-psychological analysis of why 120 million, that's how many people voted in the last presidential election, 120 million people, but we can reduce it all down to one sentence. And my bigger argument here is that you can't do that. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> oh, I forgot, I forgot to bring up the Flint report. Uh, Larry Flint, who publishes uh, Hustler magazine, as well as other endeavors in life, uh, during the Clinton impeachment years, he offered a million dollars to anyone who could come up with clear uh, convincing evidence that of a Republicans who were adulterous. And this is just full of all sorts of Republicans who back in the 90s were calling for impeachment of Clinton. And the very same Republicans who were on television every night saying Bill Clinton should be impeached were cheating on their spouses at the same time. 
A lot of people made a million dollars, so they're grateful to Larry Flint. If, if, if Larry Flint's made no other valuable social contributions to our republic, he's exposed a lot of corrupt Republicans. Yes? I'll start off questions. You said that um, when Clinton was elected back in the 90s, the Republicans hated it, and so immediately started looking for dirt. Yeah. Um, what happened when uh, Bush won after Clinton? Did the Democrats start looking for dirt? Did it, did it no. This is one of my beefs with Democrats. <laughs> they won't get down in the muck and the mire and play dirty, hardball politics to the extent Republicans will. They're wusses, okay? <laughs> the Democrats want to take the high road. I mean, even when the Democrats accuse Republicans of misconduct, they don't really go for the jugular, all right? So there were a lot of people unhappy. They took their bitterness out on the Supreme Court, that the Supreme Court elected George W. Bush. But, you know, not looking for, I mean, the Democrats controlled Congress for a number of years under Bush. I don't think if anyone in the room wants to disagree with me, come up after class week and argue the point, there is no evidence has been revealed that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. No evidence whatsoever that Saddam Hussein had any relationship with Al Qaeda. Okay? All of the reasons given for going into Iraq have been proven to be false. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have gone into Iraq, but give the reason we're going in and then do it. But don't just make up stuff like Bush and Cheney did. Just say we're going to go in and get rid of the guy because we don't like him. Fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Don't lie about it. Clinton's lies did not cost anyone their life. Bush's lies have cost thousands of lives. Not only Americans, but innocent Iraqis who get caught in the crossfire. Okay? But did the Democrats impeach Bush? Was there even a Democratic movement to impeach Bush? No. But lying about sex, that'll get you impeached. So. What other questions do we have? Or does everybody want to go up and get more food? Yes? Um, you made an observation about the Tea Party, and I just wanted to know if you would say more about that. What would you like me to say? <laughs> yes! <laughs> you said they would pay out or something. I just I, heard that in passing. But yeah. That's what you meant. Yeah, I think it'll be difficult for, for this whole intensity to maintain itself for the next, uh, what we got, seven months until the election. I mean, it's not going to totally dissipate, but we see a lot of energy and a lot of anger and rage right now. But the American attention span is about that of a turnip, okay? <laughs> we get angry about something or we get really giddy about something, but check back like two weeks later, uh, things tend to subside a little bit. So there will be, the Tea Party will still, they'll still get their press. But I don't think it'll be as, as big of a thing. And I could be totally wrong on that. Um, that's not to say these voters might not take it out on the Democrats. But as far as the whole sort of organized Tea Party thing, people can only go to so many rallies before they get bored. You know, They can only make so many death threats on the telephone uh, to members of Congress before they're arrested. So it'll eventually die down a little bit, I think. Yes, Ted. The Tea Party is having an event on April 15th, tax day, in Cole Park. And it's very sad that I'm going to be out of town <laughs> at the time of the meeting because I was clued in about another group called the Coffee Party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they have a pledge to say that says, I pledge to be civil, open, respectful of people who disagree with me. All right. And I had plans to take the pledge and their mission statement and last week's Doonesbury cartoons, which <laughs> deal with the Tea Party. You can Google it. Uh, I wanted to go down there and pass out pamphlets. So I hope someone else will do that. Yeah. The <laughs> April the 15th, Tea Party in Alamosa. Um, I think I'll have to plan a trip out of town that weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to just go see who shows up. 
Yeah, I'd probably rather not see who shows up. I'd, <laughs> I'd rather not know. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, a lot, a lot of those, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, they were ugly, very partisan. And I guess that's one of the distinctions that if you, if you go back, more of it was partisan and still less involved with people's private lives. Now, we had that because I cited you some cases. I mean, you know, Cleveland's escapades were known. Um, and circulated, but it wasn't just the media doing it, it was the opposition party doing it. Okay, so we, had, we do have a history of, the, of a very partisan press in the 19th century that was very ugly and mean-spirited, um, but still they weren't going for the private lives as much, I would argue, as they do today. That would be the matter of degree more than anything else. Erica. Good question. Um, yeah, I've looked at it and really no, which is why I didn't really put it on the board. Um, the type of scandal in the aggregate doesn't seem to make a difference, whether it's sex, financial, or, or whatever. However, in specific areas, it matters. As I was telling Robert the other day, in one year, uh, well, in two different years, Barney Frank, a very, very liberal, openly gay Democrat from Boston, was rebuked by the House for coming on with, coming on to a male page. In that same year, a Republican member of the House was brought before the Ethics Committee for coming on to a female page. In his next election, Barney Frank won with even a bigger vote than he did before. <clears throat> the Republican lost in his primary. In another year, there was a congressman from Salt Lake City who was arrested for propositioning two undercover female police officers. That same year, there was a New, e New Orleans congressman who was arrested for propositioning an undercover police officer. The New Orleans representative, they were both Democrats, by the way, the New Orleans representative uh, won re-election. The Salt Lake City representative was defeated. Okay? So a lot of this depends on the region, uh, whether or not sex might matter more in, say, conservative districts, for instance than it would in more urban and liberal districts. I'll look at that in more detail when I do the House. I'm just now completing all the work on the uh, Senate. Micah. Do you matter the, um, the level of publicity of the scandal quality so if they got reelected or not? Well, there's been research done and published saying that the more publicity, the worse off the incumbent is controlling for other variables. The problem with the, that research is they look at the national media, Washington Post, New York Times, the national media. So something may appear to not get much publicity because it's not being covered in D.C. or New York, but back home, where the actual voters are, it may be widely covered in local newspapers. And that research hasn't really been done yet, so I have methodological criticisms of the research that only looks at national media. Jan. When was the Senate Ethics Committee um, I forget the exact year. I think it's 60, uh, I'm thinking 68. And it's the House, too. And by the way, the House and Senate Ethics Committees are the only committees in Congress where there's an equal number of Democrats and Republicans. Every other committee Whichever party has a majority in Congress has a majority on every committee, but the Ethics Committee is supposed to be nonpartisan, and so they have equal numbers of uh, Democrats and Republicans. Any other insightful questions? 
Yes? Um, in your research, did you, did you have any information on whether scandals weigh heavier in the Senate, House, or the presidency elections? Well, I don't look at the presidency at all. Okay. Um, just because that would be more qualitative work, because we just haven't had that many president. I mean, we're on number, what is 44? So it's got 44 cases, and that's not a whole lot to work with. Uh, the House is the best, because every two years you got 435 new cases, so that database is wonderful. Um, my initial findings are that uh, it really doesn't matter. The senators are no more, no more or less likely to have the scandals affect them than members of the House. Yes? Um, cannot scandals be flipped and used for more positive, whether it's, it's against the incumbent? What's the positive point about being on the D.C. Madam's VIP list? <laughs> well, because unlike my opponent... Well, it I'm proves not I'm not gay! gay. <laughs> yeah, well, no, but against with someone else. I mean, if, if you were going to have someone else come in. From your part, let's say Travis was on the VIP team. Right. And um, I'm running against him, and I'm like, well, unlike my opponent, I'm upstanding, I have a family, etc. Right. So, can those not be used more strategically for the party? So that your party would run an even better candidate than they would have? That makes a certain amount of common sense, but we also know from research that's been done that divisive primaries tend to hurt a party. Uh, when you've got a really ugly primary in a party that's splintered, they're bashing each other. They're saying bad things about each other. That's what people are reading about in the newspaper. That's what they're seeing on TV. And so voters are more likely to think that whole party, they can't even get along with each other. And so divisive primaries where you've got that sort of a heated uh, primary battle are more likely to have negative consequences. Now, of course, if if you have a splintered party in a one-party state, like Massachusetts, uh, the Democrat will probably win. Or Utah, the Republican, right? Because Republicans win in Utah, and Democrats before Brown tended to win in um, Massachusetts. I don't think the Massachusetts constituency suddenly got conservative overnight. Uh, they were just lodging a protest, all those Tea Party people, they were lodging protests. What I would not want to be, I would not want to be Scott Brown's campaign manager in 2012 when he's up for re-election, because I'll and see me after the meeting, again, we'll make some bets. Uh, I would not bet that Scott Brown, the conservative Tea Party Republican, gets re-elected in uh, Massachusetts. The Democrats simply nominated a candidate who was What's worse than totally inept? What, what would be worse than totally inept is what she was. Anything else? Nothing over there? Philip, you're just busy eating? So the, the kind of gist I got out of this was that if you are going to have a scandal, you better have a whole lot of money to pour into your campaign. Yeah. And there are other things, too, that, that I'm still looking at. But the timing of the scandal is crucial. I mean, if, if you think about the, if you remember what I said about Jacobson's strategic politician theory, in order for the scandal to affect the other party, for them to run a good candidate against you, the scandal has to happen before the deadline for filing for Congress. If the scandal happens late, it's too late for the other party to find the really good candidate to run against you, right? So timing is something that affects uh, congressional elections in general, and scandals in particular. Uh, and the David Vitter case from Louisiana will be a good example because he was exposed. He's up for re-election in 2012, means he was elected in 2006, and I think that scandal broke in like 2008. Does that sound right? So he will have had four years. And again, which way does it go? One theory is he's had four years to put it behind him, bring pork back to the state, schmooze with the voters, say all sorts of nice things. He's had four years to deal with it. The other side of the coin is the Democrats have had four years to keep reminding the voters of the scandal and bringing it up again and again and again, right? So it'll be interesting to see if 
in a Senate race, it's better to have your scandal early on in your six-year term or later in your six-year terms, controlling for these other 50 variables that also uh, matter. Good question. What else? Yes? Uh, Is that Gabriel? Yes. Hi. <laughs> who, who spends the most money producing smoke in mirrors to cover up their skin? I, I don't know if that's a good question to ask. Um, <laughs> not when the person giving the lecture doesn't have the answer, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. Or I could try to figure it out. Yes. So, do you know whether or not being a Republican or a Democrat would weigh on how your scandal affects your when you run? Democrats. Now remember, and my colleagues who do this sort of research understand about small ends when you've got a few cases. The more you control for things, the fewer cases that you have, okay? I only had 65 scandals to begin with. Now 39 of them are Republican, 26 Democrats, so that's a smaller number. But <clears throat> Republicans lose 8% of the time more. Republicans with scandals lose more than Democrats, but 8% is a, actually a very small percentage when you're dealing with those few cases, and it's not what we would call statistically significant, okay? The difference isn't that great and the number of cases isn't that great. So I, I'm not willing to make any statement that one party is hurt more by scandal than the others. And when I get to the House data where I've got you know, hundreds of cases and all of that, I can, it's easier to do that. Erica? Um, this is more an opinion question. Don't ask me my opinion. Someone out there is packing a gun. I know there's a Tea Party person out there somewhere. Um, if and when um, women are represented more proportionately in Congress, do you think that um, scandals will affect them differently? Like, do you think that a female um, incumbent will be affected differently? Than well, I don't have any data on that. I know, that's why. My I supposition would be actually that women might be treated more harshly because of societal views that, you know, well, men cheat on their spouses, but women don't cheat. You know, or we expect men to be corrupt, but women, they're the homemakers, the, they give birth to our babies, you know. They're, there's some gene that women carry that make them more morally upright than men. And so I think we'll be hard. I mean, just look at the way, and I, if my Republican friends will probably disagree with this, but what is it about Hillary Clinton that Republicans just hate so much? I mean, it's this deep, 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 not dislike or disagreement, there's this hatred for Hillary, who, as far as I can tell, has exhibited no traits that aren't exhibited every day by every male member of the Senate or the House or governor or president. I mean, she, she's no different than men who are in politics. <laughs> because we have a different view of what women are supposed to, to be. So that would be my opinion. Well, there's a question that could get you even in, in even more trouble if you want to tackle it. Yeah. Do you think that when women are represented more in, in Senate or in Congress, will there be fewer scandals? I wouldn't. Well, let me think about that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There might be more, fewer scandals exposed because I think there might be a tendency on the part of the media to treat women differently. So they may not be quite as investigative. They may not look through women's trash as much as they look through men's trash. I mean, that's a possibility, uh, too. That's a very good question. Uh, I think I've artfully dodged answering it. So. <laughs> it's a better answer than it was a question, even. <laughs> Anything else?
there's no other questions, let's thank our speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.